Um, this is part nine of Beyond Good and Evil, and in some ways it's the most characteristic passage in Nietzsche. It starts out right away with nobility, hierarchy, cruelty, right into what's one of his master morality and slave morality. So I want to make sure we understand these concepts and maybe give them a fair shake in terms of their um, embeddedness in the source material. It's here, if any place, where we'll discover what Nietzsche thinks it means to be beyond good and evil. We've seen Kaufman and others indicate that this in part of this means is to be beyond a certain kind of binary, the binary of good and evil. But we also have here the, the binary of good and bad and master morality. We might ask ourselves, is this is this a, a, another better binary? A better maybe because it's creative, because it's it's self-invested, because it comes out of the person himself who identifies as good. So I want to talk about, especially sections 257 to 260, maybe the most important um, passages in the book. So what I put up on the board behind me, just special thoughts about reading this single section, which I need to ask you guys to write about for today, about enhancement of the type man. Uh, I'm happy to hear what you have to say about that. I've not read it yet. Is this a descriptive or normative claim? Is it a claim about what happened in history or what happened that's necessary for human advancement? Or does it claim about what enhancement needs? Um, the few of them I've looked over so far have been, have been quite good in terms of concepts. We'll have a short conversation about this. But looking at um, section 257 first, um, he talks about the enhancement of the type. Yeah, so we're not looking at the enhancement of individual or societies, the enhancement of the species of the human as a type, as a, uh, as a spiritual um, being, as a model. Uh, and immediately we have this discussion of nobility, right? Every advancement of man, every spiritual elevation of man, every evolution of man to a more advanced state of menhood, right? Of, of, of man, human humanity, all of it has been the work of an aristocratic society, not a democratic society. So, A society that believes in the long ladder of an order of rank and differences between man and man, suggesting this uh, this good phrase he puts in here, a pathos of distance seems to be necessary, a feeling of internal space in the society between the high and the noble and the good and the remainder of people who are not there. It's precisely that pathos of distance that Nietzsche thinks is missing from modern social democratic Europe. He thinks it is missing spiritually from Christianity to the extent that it emphasizes you know, the equality of all believers before God. Um, he's calling back to something here that we see as characteristic of his thought, the sort of uh, uh, high romantic, we might say, heroes of the Iliad, right? The great Odysseus raider of cities, you know, Ajax, defiler of the temple, all the, things, all the things that these great heroes would do. Why? Because they carried their morality within themselves, we might say in a sense, they were their morality. They acted it out. Okay, so Achilles, just he's achilles -ing. That's That's Achilles' morality. It's not any sort of exterior thing that he has to conform to. Um, one of the movies I probably will not get a chance to show this semester is The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, which I like. It's a um, John Ford, late John Ford Western with um, Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne and uh, Lee Marvin. Um, as Liberty Balance. But the interesting thing there is, for, for me, the question is, what is the source of the John Wayne character's moral code? Right? Why does he do what he does? It's very strong sort of John Wayne, you know, man's got to do what a man's got to do. Uh, my question for you, if you ever watched the movie or if you know it, is, is Tom Don does Tom Donovan do what he does? There's some, a couple of critical decisions that he makes that shape the whole uh, plot of the movie. Does he do that because he feels called to by some sort of external source, by the natural law, or by obedience to some idea of goodness, whether it's divine or, or um, some other similar origin? Or does he do it simply because it, it comes out of his being the person that he is? The next question is, is he a kind of noble man? She is self-creating, self-asserting, morals creator. Or, as a number of my people have discussed this movie with have argued, he's, he's a guy who's just sort of deeply in touch with the natural law. He knows that what's going to happen is wrong if he doesn't prevent it, and he takes action in light of that because he's obligated 
So I'm curious to know, and we can ask the same question about some other videos we can see. Why does Mr. Incredible stop bad guys? Is he an obligation to society, an obligation to use his talents in a certain way? Because this is just what heroes do. So, interesting sort of maybe a sliding scale there on the question of whether the hero's motivation is internal or external, whether his locus of morality is inward or outward, whether it's creative or received. All these are things that need just calling into question and bringing into light in this uh, kind of building on this natural history of things. So, first questions I had the order of rank, the pathos of distance, are these necessary for self overcoming at the sort of species level? Uh, if so, that indicates that, you know, to the extent that the modern European world for Nietzsche becomes more egalitarian, more democratic, more safe for the herd, it's actually losing the ability to achieve the, the great heights that human beings are capable of. Um, yeah, I, I would see a bit of a chance to move into sort of uh, Nietzsche's influence on 20th century thought. I think he goes in for, I think he does the same sort of genealogy, and I think he has a... Um, a certain type of postmodern account of humanity, human society, and ethics. So, yeah. What he doesn't seem to have, and what, what we might ask, would any Nietzschean have to have a pathos of distance? I mean, we have to have self overcoming comes at the racial level, at sort of the species level, sorry, the species level, comes from having a certain minority which knows itself to be elect and better and knows and sort of enforces a, a social and moral distinction between itself and those who are far below it. You might even say that the, 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 the greater the distance, the more sort of power is stored up in the cultural bow, bow string, right? It's kind of the war in Zarathustra shooting, shooting farther. The, the flatter society gets, the less it's capable of producing a Shakespeare or uh, a, a great artist, uh, much less a great political or social figure. Francis, you want to hand up? So I when we're when we're talking about this thing and considering um this like Nietzschean anthropology of the barbarian, um I I can't help but consider also, and I think it's been helpful for me to think of it in these terms, at least to have this comparison, um, specifically about how how Aristotle talks about barbarians in the book one of the politics. Um, so when, when we're talking about it in that context, um, it's, it's very much about capacities, right. In light of fulfillment, um, at the Greek, so it's, yeah, it's the distinction between Greeks and then barbarians. Yeah. Um, and that both are, both are fully human. And yet the, the Greeks have a certain type of capacity of, of reason and sh yeah, bodily strength. Um, and, and the barbarians themselves, um, yeah, they, they have solely the strength while the Greeks have um, both, but more so reason. Um, and when, when Nietzsche talks about it in this case, it's it's both strength and um, it's there's another component that he's using, which I, uh, it's, yeah, it's like authenticity. It's just, it's just the- well, Confidence, the, the way I was thinking right. about it. has to be a, a noble class that knows itself knows itself noble and that feels at a very deep sort of animating level its own superiority to the others in the same society. So it's not that, that we're sweet Greeks, we are superior to those barbarians on the frontier, but that we rule over people who are right. themselves inferior to us, and we know this and we realize. It. Now, this doesn't have to be in a sort of cartoonish, uh, you know, um, barbarians or you know, cruel nobles over, over innocent peasants sort of way. One could imagine even a kind of spiritual um, or, or intellectual, uh, cultural elitism, right? And there's this, you know, this one of those go to the opera. The opera's not obviously for everybody, but it, 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 you know, it, this, this pathos of distance, he thinks, is necessary. But a question right here, because it's, I'm not sure whether it is necessary for self but it certainly seems to be an important part of Nietzsche's system. And then the question here, going from the species level to the psychological level, is this what each of us needs for self overcoming Superiority of the parts to the mass in us. I put down here strength of spirit of confidence, question mark, spirit of uh, strength of reason. Reason Nietzsche seems to identify in the Socratic sense with weakness. Right? The extent that the Greeks become Socratic, they become weak. They, they, they become 
wordsmiths instead of warriors. They lose this. And then this is what maybe we'll look at Twilight later on. H is that Socrates is that he he's a kind of parasite. He kind of he gets inside of you and he starts saying you really need to have reasons for what you do. You need to be able to show these reasons to others, to engage in dialectic and self-doubt and self-justification. And Nietzsche seems not to want to go in that direction. It's not with, at least not with that vision of reason, the Socratic reason. He seems to be kind of anti-life, anti-strength, anti-power to some degree. Olivia, my question was what you were just touching on before, because when Nietzsche was talking about self-overcoming, I was wondering in in the kind of the um, the dichotomy between the the noble class and the um, the lesser class, who's doing the overcoming? Because it doesn't seem to me that he's saying that the the slave should overcome. Right? He's not for a slave. Anymore. This is more a um, the improving of that noble class. It seems to me that I mean, it, it, man is enhanced. But what is enhanced, obviously, it's going to be the, the good of the noble class. The, the whole point of modern social democracy to elevate the lowest, the whole Rawlsian impulse, right? You guys just know Rawls a bit, political philosophy. Any inequality can only be justified by elevating the people at the bottom end of the socio economic spectrum. So if nobody is, if, if the bottom people are not made worse off by an inequality, then it can be tolerated in a Rawlsian liberal society. If it makes the bottom rank worse off, then we must undo that equality. So we can have an equality of wealth, provided that it, it benefits in some way the people at the very bottom. Nietzsche virtually polar opposite, right? Any cruelty provided that it, it uses the path of to elevate man, I think that's gotta be the enhancement of the nobility. It's, it's, I've said this before, probably Nietzsche's, for Nietzsche, the model is not the model of human excellence and human progress is not the state of the modal any more than we would say, you know, the health of lions is a matter of, the excellence of lions is a matter of uh, what the most common type of lion is like. What we really want to know is what is the most excellent, the most lioness, the most leonine lion, the lion that, that is the most powerful, the largest that ever lived. And you see in a little bit, it's reflected in our biology texts. Right. You know, woolly mammoths grew up to 64 feet or whatever, whatever it turns out to be. We give you the sort of maximum because the max, that's the most that they ever achieved. Right. What One way of reading Nietzsche is that what he wants to make sure is that human humanity's self-overcoming is not all in the past. We just sort of overcome ourselves right to the point of being the last man, where we don't do greatness anymore. But that means it seems that we need to be comfortable with something much more like the aristocratic cruelty of the Homeric Greeks and, and much more suspicious of calls to, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats or elevate the rank of the uh, mortality of the very poor. Um, maybe if we feel like it, but what we really need to do is to make sure that society maintains its ability to continue pushing man to higher and higher levels of human achievement. So that's it's, it, it's, it's. I don't want to describe this just in a political and cultural sense because I think it's also meant to apply psychologically and spiritually in some other ways. The question might be is, is Nietzsche on to something? Does he have a valid psychological point to make about humanity, which could also then be extended through critique of uh, modernity, modern, modern self understanding? Go to hand up your size. Yeah, I guess is the, is the increase of the nobility in the very act of. So, like destroying or consuming the base is like is that yeah is that a means? I think that's only a means and not even a necessary means. Okay. And presumably, I mean, it's sort of Marxist critique, right? Say, well, you know, it's, 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 it's this parasitical, you know, class that, that's taking advantage of and extracting value from the people at the bottom that can't go on forever. But Nietzsche seems to be suggesting, I, not to overinterpret him, I think he's suggesting at the very least that. The more inequality there is in a society, that might be the better for, for humanity's sake. Part of what he points to here is that this is, in fact, the natural history of agrarian tribes conquer agrarian tribes and impose a new law on them. Um, one thing sort of tangentially related to this for uh, Lord of the Rings fans, I, I followed a debate between some people some time ago about... Um, 
the sort of impossibility of the Shire. Right? You guys, people read Lord of the Rings. Is there more than one or two people that are sort of recollecting this? Okay. The Shire exists because when the hobbits can't fight off their enemies, right? It exists because the Dunedain, right? Because there was this whole race of, you know, seven foot tall rangers uh, in the north who made it their business to keep outsiders and intruders and conquerors taking over the Shire. Why? What? Why was that worth it? You know, he's biding his time to leave the return and become the king. But why would the strong give a whole lifetime to protecting these little people. It, it, it seems like, from a certain sort of will to power perspective, it's tough to account for the psychology of the Duke of Dan's protection. They're the, they're, they're the sort of you know, seven foot tall warriors who stand between the Shire prior to the events of the Lord Rings, between the Shire and its, uh, and its enemies. The world doesn't work like that. There's no race of seven foot tall warriors ready to protect us. From, you know, whether with us, our, our society, our church, or whatever else, from people who are more powerful than us. Problem there. Again, for people who know the sort of it, it comes out okay in the end of discovering the Shire, because of course that's the point at which you had the four hobbits get off to work and come back and set up a kind of self-defense liberation mechanism. Prior to that, it looks just like under the grace. More of that for later on, perhaps. 